Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome and thanks for joining this call. My name, uh, thank you, Ahmed. Um, as he mentioned, my name is Grant Merrill. I'm the president and CEO of AES Clean Technology. I'm speaking to you from our uh, corporate headquarters outside of Philadelphia. So uh, grateful that you joined this talk today. I'm hopeful that uh, you'll walk away with it from this talk with some ideas that uh, how you can successfully navigate the process of developing a clean room facility that can deliver ATMPs uh, for, to the marketplace. A uh, little bit of background real quickly. I spent the last 25 years of my career focused on high-speed clean room, high-performance clean room facilities. Uh, during that time, I've had the unique opportunity of working on some really pioneering uh, clean room facilities in this space. Um, cell therapy and gene therapy treatments pose some significant manufacturing and logistical challenges that impact these facilities. The, the ATMPs have really required us to, to rethink the way that we design, install, and operate clean room facilities that support processing of these time critical treatments. Now, we've had a lot of lessons learned over the last uh, 15 years as CAR T has a uh, uh, cell and gene therapy has advanced. And uh, today's talk is going to leverage uh, a bunch of those experiences and uh, also want to lay out a roadmap for achieving successful outcomes in, in your own endeavors. The science is really the true innovation that's transforming medicine, and we recognize that as the heart of it all. But that science can't be successful without a proper wraparound facility that ensures repeatable results under GMP conditions. And that wraparound clean room facility has to be capable of integrating into various host building contexts, all of which are changing more quickly than ever before. Autologous therapies have, have certainly shifted the, the paradigm of clean room manufacturing, harvesting cells, manipulating them, and reintrodu reintroducing them back to the patient forces us to rethink about how we manage the patient as part of the logistics stream. It's no longer a traditional manufacturing model. So patient proximity to manufacturing or the logistics of product movement when manufacturing can't be closely coupled to the patient's location, both become critical factors in the overall plan for bringing these treatments to market. So the mission of every project is to ensure that the patients can receive the life-altering treatments that they need, regardless of the treatment modality or of its location in the world. And the clean room's sole purpose in life is, is to support that mission by creating a home that enables validated processing to occur without risk of the negative product, uh, uh, negative uh, impacts on the product stream due to contamination. So the functional clean room environment should be invisible. It should just work and continue to work under all conditions and at all times so that the mission can stay focused on the science. The clean room facility must reduce the risk to the product's manufacturing life cycle. From the standpoint of the initial product project development, the creation of the clean room facility itself needs to be fully predictable. That is in terms of the clean room's performance to the overall project schedule and budget, and also to its control of environmental performance that allows for reliable production of these treatments uh, that the facility is responsible to deliver. From the standpoint of ongoing manufacturing, the clean room has to remain invisible throughout its entire lifetime. That means long-term repeatable performance of environmental control systems, endurance of the architectural systems against repeated sanitization and decontamination protocols, and maximum uptime of the facility so that it can support the product demand. From the standpoint of product evolution, the clean room must be flexible to address change and to support future growth. We need to build success into the program by planning for future ev evolution of the process and for expandability of the facility because scale out is a very likely byproduct of the success of the treatment in the market. So the ability to expand the facility is imperative and expansion has to be performed without impact 
to the ongoing operation within the existing facility that's likely to be directly adjacent to the expansion area. So in a moment, I'm gonna share a few case studies of successful clean room facilities that we developed so we can pull out the critical attributes and apply those lessons learned to, to new endeavors. So over the last 15 years, uh, with the advancements in cell and gene therapy, we developed many ATMP facilities, including a few that earned uh, regulatory approval for the first uh, cell therapy and the first CAR T therapy. And, and during that time, we learned a lot. Uh, we know that the logistics of managing patient material, especially in the context of autologous treatments and coupling that with manufacturing capacity is the real challenge when it comes to ensuring that production can meet demand. And manufacturing cycle time is a critical factor as well as the reliability of the manufacturing asset because the product is so precious, you know, likely coming from a very sick patient who fought hard to provide those cells. So we're seeing a trend to close couple the manufacturing assets location to the patient's location to shorten that supply chain. So this is driving more manufacturing operations into urban centers to be close to the patient population. And with that move comes a numerous challenges that we'll discuss in a few minutes impacting scalability and expandability, segregation, and logistics. So our first case study is a clean room facility responsible for an autologous cell therapy treatment. Uh, this facility was repeat, repeated in several suburban locations with close access to large urban centers, as well as proximity to large scale air transport logistics to serve a national network of patients. Some of the features of this clean room facility were large scale production capabilities, multi-product open spaces with individual workstation areas and unidirectional flow of materials and personnel throughout the facility. The host building for this project was really ideal from the standpoint of space. We had substantial footprint and vertical clearance, as well as dedicated utility capacity to serve the facility. Walkable ceiling systems were used to gain access to the interstitial space for maintenance while the clean room core could remain operational below. Because of the vertical clearance within this host building, the interstitial space was designed for ease of access to HVAC infrastructure, environmental monitoring systems, the process utility distribution, the IT network. You can see from the photo that, that all of the major infrastructure was installed comfortably above the level of the walkable ceiling to promote uh, serviceability. We used large scale industrial HVAC systems to serve this clean room core, including some non recirculating air streams, redundancy features, uh, segregation uh, to protect uh, against cross contamination of products within the facility. Uh, the ability for future expansion was built into the design from the very beginning. On this project, this photo shows the original clinical pilot plant that was developed with dedicated adjacent space to accommodate a future expansion, which we performed three years later when the demand for this product uh, increased dramatically. Uh, we included in that original product project an extension of the modular walkable ceilings so that we could easily accommodate the installation activities of the expansion project that occurred at the same time that the pilot plant remained producing product only two inches away. And then the two plants were joined together over a brief weekend shutdown that, that joined them into one expanded facility. Our next case study is a clean room facility responsible for a CAR T treatment. This facility was located in an urban environment within a hospital campus setting, and it happened to be 150 feet in the air on the ninth floor of a 16 story building. So that led to incredibly challenging logistics uh, to create this facility in the first place, but it was ideal from the standpoint of patient proximity. Some of the features of this clean room facility were dedicated process rooms for lot isolation, 
individual close coupled HVAC systems that recirculated within, within each dedicated suite. Uh, crawlable ceilings for maintenance access. I'll give you more on that in a minute. And max visibility uh, with lots of window detailing to allow for visual communication between spaces and with uh, visual communication to the outside world, which is not really that common in these kind of spaces. The host building environment in this instance was really challenging because space is a premium in any high rise building within an urban environment. So this compressed the clean room facility both horizontally with no room for expansion and vertically due to the extremely low floor to floor heights that limited our interstitial access, hence the need for crawlable uh, maintenance access to certain systems. So this project created, really required creativity for space planning, both, both architecturally and mechanically to fit everything into a compressed space. The clean room facility also hugged the outside wall of the high rise building that's nearly all glass. So we had to address external influences within the clean room, such as HVAC solar loads and architectural detailing at the curtain walls, like you can see in the photo. Not to mention the concern of what this clean room facility looked like from the outside of the building which is not a common expectation, but certainly on the perimeter of a high profile glass building in an urban environment, this was another you know, important consideration that we had to, uh, had to contend with. So our final case study uh, is similar to the first case study from the standpoint of a wide open host building. And it's similar to the, to the second case study from the standpoint of dedicated process rooms. But this facility is, is producing an allogeneic treatment. So it has the benefit of being somewhat decoupled from the patient uh, within the supply chain. Uh, the ideal shape and size of this project's host building uh, allowed for an optimized layout of the, the facility and also for optimized flows of people and materials within the facility. We implemented a walkable ceiling uh, system to assist with ongoing maintenance access for the clean room and utilize robust HVAC infrastructure that was dedicated to maintain uh, not only environmental conditions within the spaces, but also to create isolation between product lots. The ability to expand this clean room facility in a copy and paste style was developed from the very beginning, uh, including adjacent space uh, uh, directly adjacent to the clean room for, for future expansion. And the isolated suite concept that was the basis of the clean room core gave us the flexibility for this clean room to be able to adapt to the multiple drug product candidates that, that this particular client had within their pipeline. Now this clean room facility was unique in that it also incorporated vial filling, uh, product packaging, and large scale frozen storage of drug product in order to create the inventory that was necessary for, for um, you know, the demand of this allogeneic product. So and, and just an additional feature we needed to address. So although, although these few examples are quite different from one another in terms of their location, their process technology, their infrastructure and their scale, uh, we see a pattern emerge for the critical attributes that help to, de to deliver their success. So for the balance of this discussion, I plan to leverage uh, uh, the discussion on those lessons and, and highlight the traits that we see with successful companies and their successful projects. So first and foremost, when we talk about planning for the future, uh, good planning right from the start is imperative. And for ATMP products, this really comes down to um, what is the market for this product? Is this US only? Is this an EU product, Asia Pacific, rest of the world? The answer to that question really impacts a tremendous amount of the project development. But how much product do you forecast from this facility? Not just patient material, but also ancillary demand. You know, this forecast translates into the capacity of the facility, which relates to the number of suites, the size of the suites, the infrastructure requirements, 
and ultimately to the overall footprint required for the manufacturing asset. What does the future demand look like? Are there multiple products in the pipeline? Do you need to plan for expansion? Do you need to reduce the size of the initial build out to defer capital spending until the demand increases? So there's lots to consider, but this initial planning exercise really sets the strategy for the clean room facility and then helps to determine the requirements of the host building that's going to need to accommodate that clean room. The ability to make products safely and reliably within the facility is greatly influenced by the facility's design and especially by the way that materials and personnel flow through the facility as the treatment is produced. So the logistics of inbound cells and outbound product are crucial from the standpoint of timing and also from the standpoint of chain of custody. And in any ATMP facility, we have to closely control the flows of raw materials, in-process materials, components, QC samples, waste, and the most critical of all from a contamination standpoint is the people. Crisscrossing of clean and dirty flows can lead to product contamination or, or worse yet, uh, to, to loss of product. We mitigate these risks by during the design of the facility by creating the proper adjacencies of spaces, by introducing corridors to move people and materials throughout the facility, and by creating airlocks for physical separation of spaces and for the cascade of cleanliness. Like the realtors say, location, location, location. And this applies in this context as well, but, but in a slightly different way, you know, the building that will ultimately host the GMP clean room facility is absolutely a critical piece of this puzzle. Not only does that clean, the clean room facility need to properly lay out within that host building so that it can meet GMP requirements for flow of materials, flow of personnel, but the host building has to be able to accommodate the expansion of the GMP area in the event that the there's future growth in, in the manufacturing requirements. And in order for the clean room to be fully operational, the host building also has to be able to support it from the standpoint of infrastructure. So the critical attributes of host building infrastructure include sufficient structural supports, electrical capacity, incoming water supply, outgoing sewer capacity, utilities for cooling and dehumidifying, dedicated utilities to support the processing of the product, high-speed communication capabilities, the, the list goes on and on. And, and certainly speaking from experience, many of the existing buildings that are initially considered as the home for future GMP operations are woefully underprepared to provide the necessary infrastructure. So this is a very important aspect of a project's due diligence, for sure. Not only does the host building need to be studied for the capacity and the quality of the infrastructure that it can provide, but for the necessary segregation that has to be in place to ensure that the interim facility can operate without impact from the surrounding spaces. And even more importantly, if it's within a multi-tenant building, as some clients consider, can the clean room truly be isolated from the impacts of adjacent businesses? I had a recent example with a client, we were developing a cell treatment, a cell therapy facility, and uh, they were later informed by the landlord in their multi-tenant building that, uh, that a tenant was moving in next door that was going to be performing COVID testing. And uh, they, had, they had no control over that decision prior to it being made. So, so certainly in the context of multi-tenant buildings, there's a lot to consider to protect the investment and isolate the, the clean room investment from the rest of the world. The mission of the personnel making the product and, and of the clean room facility that wraps around those people is to protect the product as it's manufactured, ultimately protecting the patient. And this starts with proper environmental controls to manage temperature, humidity, cleanliness, and pressure cascade within the clean room. We add and subtract energy to control temp and humidity. 
We filter the airflow and steer it within the facility to address the cleanliness. And we pressurize the spaces to keep contamination out. In certain circumstances, we have to contain certain steps of the process to properly segregate uh, one product from another product, for example. So we utilize a reverse pressure cascade strategy to solve those problems. Current ATMP processing is very intense from the standpoint of human intervention and people are the largest contamination source within the clean room. So the environmental controls and the operating protocols have to overcome the contamination burden that the personnel present to the process. So dedicated HVAC systems with high performance capabilities and max uptime are our tool that we utilize to guarantee performance uh, against all those odds. And, and really these HVAC systems are the heart of the clean room. And they're also the most important from the standpoint of integration within the host building because they require physical space, both horizontally and vertically. They require dedicated utilities, connectivity for control and monitoring and accessibility for, for proper maintenance throughout their lifetime. Lastly, from a critical attribute standpoint, uh, successful clean room facilities anticipate advancements. As you're all aware, the ATMP, facil uh, the ATMP marketplace is incredibly dynamic and um, advancements are happening every day in the science. Uh, the best way to future-proof the clean room facility is to expect that evolution and to build in flexibility to accommodate those future innovations. So single-use technologies already dominate the ATMP field, but, but certainly that industry continues to innovate and we, we expect future advancements that will impact the way facilities are developed. Um, in the highly manual world of autologous treatment manufacturing, um, automation represents a, a great opportunity to dramatically change the paradigm, reducing risk, increasing speed, and ultimately lowering the cost of goods by reducing the in, human input into the process. So does your GMP facility have a playground for developing automated solutions? Do you have flexibility to change? by incorporating flexibility and adaptability within the clean room facility to address changes when, when they will no doubt arise in the future. If I were to summarize this talk into a checklist of uh, to, for keeping yourself out of trouble from the standpoint of developing a clean room facility, I'd boil it down to four critical steps. Number one would be know your product's market and anticipate its demand to the best of your ability. This will ensure that the clean room is right sized and that it's also capable of addressing future growth. Choose your host building wisely. Even if you're developing a brand new purpose built purpose built facility to wrap around the clean room, know that the host building's capabilities understand its handshakes with the clean room facility. This is the most critical manufacturing asset in the facility. Know your process and plan for how it can evolve over time, including breakthrough, breakthrough technology and automation. And know how your clean room facility will consistently protect your product over the, its lifetime so that the patient outcome can be optimized. Really, that's our noble goal as we're, as we're serving the patient with these treatments that these facilities will ultimately provide. So for me, this abbreviated presentation was a bit, bit like building uh, a clean room in, within a, a high rise building. It was compressed uh, to the point of being uncomfortable, but uh, I'm hopeful that the lessons that I shared in this short discussion really give you a lot to think about as you, you set forth in, in uh, developing the direction of your business. Uh, our website is here on the on the screen, um, and my contact information is is in the in the portal within the within the summit. And uh, I welcome conversation uh, where we can get into more detail about the, the the content that we really kind of sped through here in this presentation. Um, I do know that we have a few moments left uh, where we could take a couple questions. So um, I will open up the floor in the event that there's uh, there's any questions.
Yep, thank you. Uh, am I audible? Yep, okay. Thanks, Grant, for an insightful talk. We not muted. only learned the important I'm aspects of the clean it. room facilities tailored for cell therapy applications, but also you walked us through three interesting case studies. Uh, I'll start with my own question. So, whether you recommend a negative sink in the airlocks adjoining the process and the entry exit uh, rooms next to the uh, you know, corridor. Uh, so, that's my question. Like, whether a negative sink is required, which is like a pressure, negative, negative pressure. Yeah, so we usually look at that question in the context of do we need to isolate from the standpoint of, of uh, product to product cross contamination. So in the context of a single product facility, a negative pressure sink is unnecessary uh, in terms of isolation. Um, certainly in potent compound facilities and other facilities where we might have aspects of the process that are dangerous uh, to the people that are working there or, or outside of there, we may introduce negative pressure sinks. But typically um, in most of these facilities, it's positive pressure cascade for the purposes of pr protecting the product. But we do introduce the combination of a positive pressure airlock and a negative pressure airlock in the case of clean containment, which we would do uh, for separating products, for example, be, between multiple products in the same facility. So I, I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I'll take a couple of questions from audiences. Uh, so the first question is, uh, what characteristics should one look for in a host building? Yeah, I mean, that's a, I think my priorities there would be space, infrastructure, the ability to segregate from others if, if this is a multi-use facility, um, and, and certainly physical location with regard to the patient may be important, uh, but certainly the, um, the ability of the, of the facility to support invisible processing, the facility just works, the infrastructure from the host building is reliable. Those are really the things that, that I look at when I when I consider a host building. Um, sometimes we have to squeeze into very small spaces and that's okay. But ideally when we have sufficient vertical and horizontal uh, uh, space to work with, it really allows us to, to tailor the facility to be more to be more flexible ultimately, which which in this space is really important. So Okay, the, the another one is uh, how does a clean room design changes from FTA versus um, European uh, regulation, regulation? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, and it really speaks to the conversation we were just having about airlock strategy. Certainly, the EU does a very nice job of clearly defining expectations of the facility from a cleanliness level standpoint, pressure cascade, airlock philosophy. And certainly um, for a facility that needs to serve the European market, that may increase the expectations on the facility as compared to one that only serves the U.S. market. Pardon me, but what we've what we've advocated most of our clients consider, even if their product in the short term isn't going to address uh, outside of the U.S., that we consider the the EU guidelines as the standard of care for the facility because it it really does a nice job defining what we should do. It does require some additional spaces, but it's it, we think that's a really important way to do things. I see. I see. So I'll, I'll go with the last question for uh, you know for today's session. Uh, do you have any advice on avoiding common project hurdles and pitfalls? Yeah, great question. So I, I would say invest time early to develop a conceptual layout of the facility so that you can prove out your flows within the facility. You know, create a validatable concept. Um, this can be done with or without the host building context, really, um, and then could be tailored once the host building is known where the facility would go. But we can then use this, this uh, that facility concept to then create the financial model, which the budget for the project, the, the schedule for the project, so that really the project is off to a great start from the very beginning as it's presented to the stakeholders that are going to invest in it. So, you know, I think that first and foremost, and then of course, 
you know, study hard that host building. If it's an existing building that you're going to go into, um, study that very hard for its capabilities. And then lastly, I would advocate that the quality, get the quality team involved as early as possible in the development of the facility, because ultimately they're their judgment will be a huge part of the success of the operation. So uh, definitely involve quality really. Thank you very much. Um, so I, I would like to uh, thank you one more time and uh, would like to request you to in the rest of the conference.